We negate contention one is foreign aid. Article nine is turned Japan into the fourth largest aid donor globally. Fukaro five agrees. Foreign aid is the pillar of Japanese diplomacy and the government uses economic assistance to influence policies in developing countries due to the fact that all military actions are prohibited by article nine. Unfortunately, revision provides Japan a militaristic alternative. As Hang 19 argues, revising article nine could undermine decades of international aid flows in Japan may lose incentives to make contributions because they don't have to rely on soft power, but instead shift to hard power. Japanese aid outflows are crucial. As Addison 15 contends, infrastructure investment can lift millions out of poverty. Japan with its experience should continue to make a major contribution. Contention to is Star Wars. Currently, Fadden 20 writes that Japan is legally restricted when it comes to space capabilities. Based on Article 9, Japan's use of space is purely defensive. Affirming flips the script. 12th and 18 warrants that space provides an avenue for the JSDF in revision of Article 9, which Fadden contextualizes could materialize through the acquisition of strike capabilities in Japan's own ASATs. Weaponizing with Dragon China. Chang'o 9 contends. A Japan capable of undertaking space responses would arouse the ire of China, concluding a space race would precipitate. This risks conflict. As Finch, uh, Finch 15 writes that space is an offensive dominant domain, holding targets Targets at, uh, holding targets at risk is far easier than defending them. This could lead to a first strike instability, creating pressure for early action, a clear recipe for miscalculation. Indeed, Mitchell 01 furthers, a backup would make more inevitable. Any nation subject to a space attack would retaliate with nuclear weapons. Contention 3 is security guarantees. U.S. alliances stand strong. Need 22 explains overbearing Chinese policies in, this, uh, in the Pacific have strengthened U.S. allies and Russian threats to Ukraine are reminding Europeans why Washington is a good ally. Unfortunately, affirming signals Japan doesn't trust US, uh, America's military. Walsworth 19 explains, offensive capability could be interpreted by neighbors as a sign Tokyo is losing confidence in the U.S. This could start a chain reaction that causes more U.S. allies to develop their own strike capabilities, increasing instability. Reduced confidence spills over. ULA 21 explains that the Asia Pacific plays an important role in the international affairs, home of half the world. The world order will be shaped by the politics of Asia Pacific, and the U.S. has to play a role in it. Confidence is key. Brand 17 concludes that the U.S. alliances deter aggressors by raising the possibility that an attack will mean a fight for with the world's most formidable military. Adding security guarantees will allow alliances to underbuild their military and avert arms races, security competitions in the early areas. Thus, Barnett 11 finds the U.S. military resulted in a 99% drop in deaths due to war. Conversely, Man 14 concludes, reduced allied confidence in America's security guarantees could cause instability with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, sorry, contention for is constitutional chaos. Sub 1A is revision spiral. Despite occasional reinterpretation, the CFR 20 explains for 70 years, Japan's constitution has remained untouched, a symbol of democratic society. Breaking this taboo would open Pandora's box. As Sterling 20 explains, if Article 9 is revived, uh, revised, all other clauses would need to be revised as well because all clauses of the Japanese constitution constitution are interconnected. Japan's right-wing LDP would take advantage, turning Japan authoritarianism. Gordon 93 explains, revision of Article 9 would open the door to conservative revision of other parts of the National Charter concerning guarantees of individual rights and the status of the emperor, concluding con constitutional revision is the most dramatic concern about democracy in Japan. Specifically, Takahashi 16 confirms, the LDP's draft revised constitution is a model for dictators everywhere. Rights would be restricted while authorities enjoy unfettered power. This would be devastating as Solus 21 explains Japan plays a central role to rekindle liberal internationalism and the country boasts one of Asia's oldest democracies concluding that Japan's credentials matter more at a time uh, at a time of widespread democratic backsliding. Beyond millions of direct death, this breeds existential threats. As Diamond 19 confirms, the main threats to security all stem from authoritarianism, whether supporting international terrorism, proliferating weapons of mass destruction, or threatening neighbors. Subpoint B is modeling. Article 9 has pacified East, East Asia. Tonison explains that Article 9 is deeply embedded in the East Asian peace, but its key role has never been recognized. Article 9 has hugely contributed to East Asia pacification by creating a model of na national peaceful development. Empirically, Tonneson 14 furthers. In the years 1946 to 79, 80% of people killed in war were in East Asia. Since 1990, 3.5. Japan and Article 9 are the vanguard of that story, concluding that if it were revised, it would destabilize the region. In that event, Selim 13 warns, in a vicious uh, circle of regional tensions fuel each other in East Asia, escalating into global conflict. Devastatingly, Dowd 15 concludes, the next great power war would involve nuclear Nuclear weapons inviting miscalculation and star 15 warrants. A nuclear war would create an environment too cold and dark to grow food, food, and humans would vanish forever. Thus, we negate. Do you also want a speech doc for our case? Like with the cards and stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just. Okay, yeah, give me like two seconds, I'll get that and send it. Okay, do you, is it okay if I send it in the chat or would you rather like me email it to you? Uh, email it to you would be best. Okay, cool. Okay, I just sent it. Once everyone confirms that they got it, I can start. So just let me know.
We got it. Perfect. Did anyone not get it? No? Great. Venetia and I affirm our sole contention is a new world order. The global order is shifting. Hani 22 explains that the U.S. invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan clearly show the decline of its overall hegemony. While the U.S. may still be the world's strongest military power, it can no longer exercise the same hegemony it did in the past. Hussein 22 furthers that despite the browbeating of U.S. politicians to take a side in the Ukraine conflict, a growing number of countries have turned a neutral path, resisting calls to isolate Russia or sanction its economy. France 22 asks, Quote, is it any surprise that Chinese planes are flying over Taiwan or that North Korea is testing missiles again? They all sense Biden's weakness. Though U.S. global influence is waning, Japan's reliance on the U.S. is frozen in time. Chandler Avery 19 explains that a strict division of labor remains in Japan, with the U.S. responsible for offense and Japan responsible for defense. Japan's security policy must adapt it to the changing world order. With that, subpoint A is North Korea. Choi 22 explains the decline of U.S. military prowess means the U.S. must revise its global security plan. Choi continues that conservative Yoon suk Yeol has suggested that the South should launch a preemptive strike against Pyongyang, with U.S. military priorities likely to shift out of necessity and a hardline leader in South Korea, the risk of Korean war looms larger than ever before. Indeed, North Korea has been pushing its limits. Lee 22 reports that North Korea has already exerted pressure by demonstrating its missile capabilities eight different times. France 22 explains that at the same time, the United States seems to be turning a blind eye to the recent missile launches. Unfortunately, in the event of war, North Korea would launch a broad nuclear attack designed to warn enemies not to provoke further attacks. Yokota, a joint US-Japanese base, would almost certainly become a target. Indeed, Klingler 21 continues that Pyongyang is producing a new generation of advanced mobile missiles, which provide a greater ability to evade allied missile defense systems. Jap Japanese defense and US offense alone is insufficient. Klinger furthers that a Japanese ability to quote, shoot the archer rather than intercepting all incoming arrows would disrupt an opponent's ability to conduct follow on attacks. Conversely, a continued Japanese reliance on US only counterattacks could overtax America's ability to respond to North Korea's expanding and increasingly sophisticated missile force. The threat must be countered as Mizokami 22 terms criminalizes that a nuclear attack on Tokyo would kill tens of thousands and cause long-term health problems for millions. Subpoint B is China. Herald 17 explains that the US and Japan face a dilemma. China has tried to change the status quo in the Indo-Pacific without firing a shot, gradually shifting the strategic playing field through the gray zone coercion, moves that lie below the threshold that would trigger a military response. Yoshihara 17 states that China started out with light gray, largely inoffensive gray zone tactics 25 years ago, but they darkened into coercion over time as its ambitions and power mounted. Layton 21 explains that China remains hard at work using its innovative gray zone tactics to further its ceaseless quest for strategic advantage over its neighbors. But Japan is ill-equipped to tackle the gray zone. Well, Daniel and Bradford 21 write that Washington's security commitment is triggered by a quote, only an armed attack, not by gray zone challenges. Hence, deterrence through collective security has been harder to achieve. Bernstein in 21 explains that gray zone operations continue to change, making it harder to reach a consensus within the alliance on what constitutes an armed attack. Leighton 21 continues that an important part of successful gray zone counter is the capability to respond quickly to new developments. Allowing a new Chinese gray zone step to become the accepted new normal may make reversing it or even registering disapproval problematic. Revising Article 9 is key to countering this threat. Iwama 21 states that if Japan wants to halt China's gradual efforts to change the facts on the ground in East Asia, it needs to wield a seamless set of deterrent measures encompassing various conventional warfighting capabilities. If Japan fails to deliver clear messages and China interprets it as the existence of a power vacuum, it is certain to exploit them to expand its own sphere of influence. Otherwise, Bernstein 21 writes that China will likely continue to exploit this weakness and challenge Japanese claims to the Senpaku Islands, as well as Japan's ECZ and AD DIC. Its gray zone methods have achieved success and Beijing will continue. O'Hanlon 19 continues that gray zone conflicts are not matters of conjecture and that they're already evident. As China gains the upper hand, the chances of war increase. O'Hanlon explains that an aggressor could choose to roll the dice and then Washington could elect to escalate, culminating in an all out war that kills millions of people. Thus we affirm. Ready for cross. Yeah. Can I take the first question if that's cool? Sure. Okay. Uh, so your evidence indicates that uh, right now South Korea is pressuring North Korea. So why would North Korea strike Japan? Because it stops a U.S. response from making the conflict worse. That's our evidence in case that indicates that they would target, I believe, the base is called Yokota. Yeah. And so they want that to be a target because that prevents the U.S. from getting involved in the region further. Because right now the U.S. is pretty distant from the region and whatever limited presence they have is only maintained by the Japanese. Can I take a question? Okay, sure. Okay, let's talk about your first contention on foreign aid. Well, who does Japan give foreign aid to and has like how well has it worked? I mean, like a lot of different people. We would like argue- An example. Uh, like the Middle East, we'd argue- uh, like, the Middle East. It's a pretty broad region. 
like Thailand. Okay, what have they done in Thailand? How successful has it been? Like, what's the general like impact of Japanese foreign aid? Because your card just says Japan is key to helping countries, but I just want to know what that kind of looks like. Yeah, it's like increased GDP, increased like ability to facilitate social services. Like, how have they done that? Like, what has Japanese foreign aid specifically funded to increase Thai GDP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do one of two things. Either they, like, go and give money to the government to, like, facilitate the construction of infrastructure, or B, they actually, like, go and, like, send, like, I don't know, like, hire builders or something, and they, like, actually build infrastructure, like, help, you know, facilitate uh, the bureaucracy of, like, whatever government they're trying to help. Can I take a question? the only country they've been helping, or has it just been more? Like, what's that like? I gave you the example of the Middle East, but you didn't like it because it wasn't specific enough. I mean, the Middle East is a pretty broad example. I'm just, like, trying to see, like, what the efficacy of you know Japanese foreign aid is it's just one country is it like a multiple countries around the world like the Middle East is quite big so I was just trying to get some more specifics out of that but you can take a question if you want okay cool uh my second question is um what is China's goal in this like gray zoning um oh yeah that's a really good question so the goal of their actual gray zone attacks is to gain strategic influence in the region they want a strategic advantage so they want to be able to establish their power and establish kind of their supremacy in the Asian Indo-Pacific arena. So with these gray zone attacks, they're basically kind of like marking their territory or just like establishing their dominance. And so it's kind of like establishing themselves as a quote unquote top dog in the region. I have a follow up. Sure. Okay. So like, how does, according to you, flying warplanes over Taiwan give them strategic like advantages or dominance? It's sure. Like- so flying warplanes without any repercussions basically means that China is able to flex and kind of get away with it. Also, also, airplanes is not the only type of grazing attacks that they do. They've also been claiming islands like the Senkaku Islands or other islands in the South China Sea that are previously inhabited, and they built them and built military bases on them to expand their EEZ. Like, that's just another example of what they are doing to try to expand their influence, their territory, and thus by extension, their power. Can I take a question? Yeah. Can I just, how is that strategic? Because if you control like an extra 200 nautical miles off your territory, you have a lot more say as to what ships pass through them. Or let's say you want to put an embargo on another country. You can say that your ships can't pass through these waters. Like there's a lot that China can do with just having more territory. It's just, I guess, basic geopolitics. Okay, it's just going to go down their case, a normal rebuttal. So is anybody not ready? Begin at the top with mountains of debt and little experience. Wadsworth 19 writes, it would be at least a decade until Japan would have a useful, independent, conventional military strike capability. Thus, we outweigh on time frame because our arguments are perceptual on their uniqueness. One, even if overall American influence is waning, regional hegemony is not. A, Biden reaffirmed commitments to Asian last week. B, China has failed to capitalize. Maze Line 22 explains China has adopted a coercive, belligerent style of diplomacy that has alienated countries in its neighborhoods. C is repositioning as Hass 22 writes, with gradual de emphasis on the Middle East, rebalancing of focus in the, to the region is real. Thus, Reinhardt three days ago writes, the image of US leadership is stronger than it has been in years across the continent. And Southeast Asia polls show the U.S. is the most positively viewed. Prefer our evidence. It's actual polling. There's this pure conjecture. Also, it's more recent. This also serves as a turn. Batten 18 writes, Japan's move towards offense will exacerbate the deter versus restraint dilemma for Washington. The U.S. could be tempted to distance itself to mitigate entrapment. This would pull the two allies closer apart or farther apart. Two, Anderson 22 postdates and writes, the U.S. extended deterrence posture in the Indo-Pacific remains robust thanks to the strength and reach of the U.S. nuclear triad. And one month ago, Chandu 22 wrote that Biden promised 1.8 billion to support the Indo-Pacific strategy along with another 400 million to counter malign Chinese behavior. This also directly responds to Grayson warfare. Three, their Ukraine specific, specific is false. A, dozens of countries are sanctioned Russia. B, the war is drawing allies closer out of fear. Hilly 22 finds Ukraine has spurred some, some of Washington's closest allies in Asia to harden their stance against China. Four, their France 22 evidence is, an act, is actually a tweet from Nikki Haley, a laughing stop of the Republican Party who hates Biden. It also doesn't make any sense. China and North Korea have had minor incursions and planes fly, flying over countries for, since literally forever on North Korea specifically. One, even if Biden has turned a blind eye temporarily, that doesn't mean he'd ignore a big strike. U.S. extended deterrence still checks the risk of war. Two, their uniqueness evidence is an opinion piece capitalizing on media frenzy. Instead, Rich 22 writes, there are various reasons to assume that even if relations sour under you, North Korea is unlikely to use its nuclear weapons. North Korea already possesses the ability to inflict heavy damage with non-nuclear artillery. That said, North Korea's strategies don't preclude the use of nukes if it's seen as necessary for survival. Third, you can turn their argument. Assurance with 16 writes, given Pyongyang's history of perceiving any Japanese move as an existential threat, an offensive Japan may push Kim Jong-un to a nuclear frame to strike. Four, turn it. Harboring bitter memories of Japan's World War II atrocities, Vogel 17 writes, Japan acting as normal without Article 9 will definitely aggravate tensions with South Korea. Two implications. A, it erodes the credibility of Japan's deterrent, and B, it causes proliferation. As Yim 21 writes, Japan could build a nuclear arsenal faster than South Korea could. This gives South Korea a strong incentive to build nuclear weapons preemptively. This provides Kim the ultimate incentive to first strike, especially given Yoon's hard stance. Also, prolif would compli- complicate security dilemmas across the region, causing armed races that overshadow Japan's deterrent. And fifth, Japan can't deter us. Wadsworth 19 writes, a conventional strike capability 
wouldn't eliminate the nuclear threat posed by North Korea because of mobile launch vehicles and underground silos. Lastly, the link is incoherent. South Korea is allies with the U.S. and so is Japan. If South Korea is pressuring North Korea, they wouldn't get retaliated against if they attack Japan as well. On Gray Zone War, one, it's not unique. As Crosscut 20 writes, while Japan operates within the pacifist constitution, it has the authority to respond to the full range of threats in the gray zone. Our evidence is just more specific. Two, gray zone operations stay gray. Layton 21 explains gray zone operations are designed to avoid military escalation. This requires the operations to be tightly controlled and tactical level at the tactical level by senior leaders. Gray zone activities are carefully scripted brinkmanship. Prefer on probability as there have been hundreds of infractions for the last 25 years, but no escalation. Three, diplomacy solves. Zoo 21 writes, China and Asian have agreed on the code of conduct for the South China Sea. Beijing would never make further claims or take unilateral moves to intensify disputes, concluding it would avoid conflicts. Thus, NGOC 22 finds tensions between China have cooled even as China increased military activity in the SCS. Four, they say having the option to go offensive complicates China's decision calculus. That doesn't apply to grace and warfare since the entire point is that it's great, plausible deniability, low level provocations, et cetera. Nothing that would risk response. Five, Japan's strategically defensive posture doesn't matter. Hornook 20 writes, regardless of what Japan calls its new capabilities, the region will see them as offensive weapons. Revising Article 9 is quite literally the opposite of a clear message. Six, turn it. While, Japan, uh, while China currently operates in the gray zone, affirming causes direct conflict through A, perceptions. Anthony O2 writes, any change in Article 9 would immediately be perceived in Beijing as a clear signal that Japan has succumbed to nationalist forces. And Hornock 20 for those, China may have incentives to preemptively attack Japan to ensure early success. And B is hardliners. As Strowman 16 explains, an offense of Japan can provoke massive retaliation by hawks in Beijing and be used as an act justifying war. And C is emboldened. As Calder earlier, its revision of Article 9 supporting Japan's reemergence as a great power with a nationalist agenda might isolate Japan from other countries that will either jump on that will jump on the Chinese bandwagon. And lastly, they say an aggressor could choose to roll the dice, but nothing suggests they would. Mutual interest hotlines and decades of peace disprove their argument. Can I get a speech doc? Also, if there's a card that these countries have hotlines, can I see it? That was your seventh response on C sub point B. Here, I sent the doc. Uh, are you sending a card for the hotlines? I said that was an analytic. Oh, okay. Got it. Are we taking prep? Okay, that was, hold on one sec. Let me check the call history because I didn't time. Okay, that was 50 seconds. Is everyone ready? It's gonna be just down our case and then their case. Their case is going to be starting on their C3, just so it's not confusing when I get there. Sorry, C4. Okay. 
At the top, they say it's going to take a decade for Japan to develop its conventional military strike. We agree. We're not saying that Japan needs to developing anything new. We say their existing capabilities are enough. Then they say that even if American overall influence is waning, that's not true. They cite a study. They cite a poll. Maybe it was published two days ago, but the poll is from 2020. And then they say that Biden's reaffirming his commitment to alliances. But that's not actually anything because we say that even if Biden's reaffirming his commitment to alliances, it still means that China and North Korea perceive them as weaker. We don't need to win that the U.S. overall is weaker. We need to win that they're being perceived as weaker. And that's clearly true, given that their actions are doing more more missile tests and more gray zone attacks. Then they say that the United States is going to be more afraid of being entangled. But the CFR says that the United States literally asked Japan to do this remilitarization and rise Article 9. So clearly it, the United States is not really afraid of entanglement. Then they say the the U.S. nuclear deterrent deters them, but the U.S. nuclear deterrent doesn't actually, the U.S. nuclear deterrent does not de deter gray zone attacks because, as we say, it falls below the threshold for a retaliation. They say allies have gotten closer. Again, it's not about the U.S. actually lo losing power, but them being perceived as weaker. Then they say that the, uh, the countries like hate, that, that Nikki Haley like hates Biden. And again, it's like their actions, they are doing more uh, retaliation in the status quo. Then on North Korea, they say North Korea is going to do a preemptive strike. No, that we tell you that North Korea is never going to do a preemptive strike. They know they'd be destroyed by the U.S. nuclear deterrent, as they themselves tell you the only situation is when there's already a Korean war, which is only accessed by our link. Then they say the tensions are increasing. That's going to destroy the Japanese deterrent. But the Japanese deterrent does not exist, as we tell you, because Article 9 exists. But then they say South Korea is going to proliferate. Kulaki tells you that South Korea doesn't proliferate because of anti-voter nuclear norms within the country. On China, they say it's not unique because there's a that Japan can already deter gray zone. Yeah, that's exactly our argument. Japan can because they have a strong military, but they can't use it because they rely on the United States in Article 9. They say it's going to stay gray. This ignores all of our handling evidence. It says aggressors are prone to risk averse actions, and they're going to accidentally miscalculate the red line and cause war. They say that diplomacy solves uniqueness, proves it's wrong. China is aggressing in the status quo. Literally just a couple of days ago, they sent more and more ships onto the Senkaku Islands. They say they're not going to risk a response. Again, just cross by the red line response here too. Then they say it increases conflict because it signals that Japan is nationalist. LSC writes that Japan already has nationalists in power. Then they say there's hawks in Beijing. But again, they don't want war. As per their own reasons, that they, Japan does not want war. Hawks don't have unique power over the president to do that. They don't give you the warranty for that. They say allies go with China. This evidence was written under the Zhu administration in China, not the new, not, not Xi, who is a lot more who's a lot more hardline then they say there's hotlines this is uncarded there are no hotlines between china and japan they literally hate each other on their case on c4 on sub point a about revision the new york times tells you that our abe reinterpreted in 2014 which means the taboo is gone there are evidences before the reinterpretation but then secondly revising other parts of the constitution wouldn't happen because a the cfr writes that it would have to be voted on by the public and there's no appetite for that b but you could turn it because there's going to be there's a strong opposition to it that would show up in force which can cause a coup which could end up with people being killed but then third they jump a step by just saying that a revision means that the ldp draft constitution would be passed, but A, this literally was proposed in 2012 and failed because it was too much of a return to Japanese Japan's militaristic past. But fourth, you can turn it because Lyft tells you that the Komeito party in, uh, in, in Japan actually prevents them from being able to pass these hawkish policies like the LDP draft constitution, but that's actually a way to vote for us because it, the, the Komeito party campaigns on not having Article 9 revised, but Article 9 being revised under the Komeito party means that they they lose part, they lose power and they can't no longer act as a break on them. On modeling, one, again, crossed by the A party re reinterpreted, it's no longer a symbol for peace, but secondly, destabilized relies on people seeing Japan as a threat, and court tells you that no analysts in Asia see Japan as a realistic threat, which means that, that that's not going to happen. Also, they don't ever tell you that Japan's a threat. Don't let them do it in a later speech. On C3, one, on strengthening alliances, one, they rely on the United States for defense, so there's no impact. But secondly, okay, and there's no impact. Then on their second top point, they say, we one, this assumes that U.S. credibility isn't already declining, but two, the CFR that the United States has already been asking for, but three, Biden has already been doing a lot to strengthen its alliances before they still need the United States to counter their uh, the, to counter their threats. On sub point two, on contention two about Star Wars, one, the ISDP in 2020 writes that Japan is already militarizing in space. It's the leader, in fact, but secondly, Dragon China is unwarranted and uncarded, but three, it just says it was I or J Japan, if Japan could respond, they still can't respond because they still have no war clause under Article 9. On foreign aid, number one, all of their evidence says Article 9 ceases to exist, not that it's revised, but secondly, Eve, they still need soft power because it would bring them to the table to use their hard power. But three, there's external reasons like trying to get a UN Security Council seat as to why they use uh, they do foreign aid. There's still reasons they do it. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, can we actually get the cards? Yeah, can you send the cards you read? Um, like which ones? All of them. Uh, I, you can ask for specific ones. I, I do my rebuttals off my flows. You can ask for, if you have anything in particular. Are New York Times, and then the court evidence. Can we also live evidence? It's that, uh, it prevents hawks and, like, policy or something. Can you just say that, like, one more time? Yeah, the lip evidence, it was, like, uh, hawks, like, don't want the policy or something. It was the response to, like, hawks. Huh? You just said lip. That's all I got. Okay, like, the Komeito stuff. Is that what you want? Yeah. Yeah, I think I. Okay.
Yeah, I'll send it. So can you just put the ones that you want in the chat? I just want to make sure I, I want to make sure I get everything. So you wanted the core evidence, you wanted the CFR evidence. Times okay. Oh, core. Yeah, that's core. Right. I may have missed it again, but prep is running, right? Uh, no, I, I think we're just waiting on them to send evidence. Okay, okay. one of the cards is pasting weird, so I'm just going to take an extra second to reformat that, but the other ones are... The only reason I ask is that it looks like y'all were talking, and that seems like prep to me, so I just want to make sure it's there. Oh, okay. I, I think uh, one of the... Like the the TOC guidelines is uh, you can yeah. At the, I can also at the TOC when they're calling for evidence and pulling it up, you can use unlimited prep time. It's in the rule book. Okay. Um, are we? Yeah, on? it's to incentive. Yeah. It's, the, it's okay. to incentivize faster evidence exchanges. All of the cards have been sent. Um, there one, the most recent one, the for some reason the underlining didn't go through, but it is like a much larger font and italicized. So let me know if that's like a problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, in that case, we're going to start actual prep uh, before crossfire. Uh, it was I'll give I'll give a thumbs up. That was 150. Are you ready for cross? Yep. You know, first question. Okay. Can you explain like the Comito party turn? Oh, yeah, sure. So right now the LDP and the Comito are like a joint ruling coalition. So the Comito points supporters to vote for the LDP. So it has, because of that, it has kind of a, it has a veto power over the LDP. And the Komeito is like a Buddhist lay movement. They are very anti-war, they're very pro-pacifism, and their main differentiator between the LDP party is like what is in Article 9, that piece stuff. So our argument is that right now, the reason why things like the draft constitution aren't being passed, and it's in the card, is because the Komeito exists and they use their veto power to prevent those really hawkish, ambitious war warmongering things from being passed, but they lose support if Article 9 is passed under them. So that's the draft constitution is passed either way. Make okay. sense? Yeah. Okay. 
Cool. Um, let's talk about your argument on strengthening allies. So your how who's who's doing the nuclear strike here? I'm just confused. Like we're just there's like a few steps being jumped. What argument are you talking about? Strengthening allies. That like our contention three. Yeah, like who is who's striking? Oh. Who's who's using nukes? nuclear strikes we just said that countries like would be like aggressive revisionist countries like china and russia would become more aggressive and the u.s military because it's had the ability to deter those sorts of conflicts but I mean, you say that they're like their getting 90- their own like their own strike capabilities are these nuclear yeah, so like, if china's on your border and china feels like they're uncontested then um for many countries it will feel like use your weapons of mass destruction or lose them so it's a use it or lose the situation for them and that results in those countries so China them. and Russia are going to like strike these countries because uh-huh. they develop their own strike. That's control. one scenario, right? But that's not the only. Well, well, what is your scenario? I mean, it can be either of the two. I don't think it like matters for the impact. No, I'm just I'm just asking you like who's going to get their own strike capability? Like which countries? Like border Russia and like countries in Europe, like Germany maybe for uh, Russia. But you um, tell me that those are really assured right now because of NATO. Like you say that on our case. Yeah, yeah. And then if you were to revise Article 9, uh, the argument in the contention is that credibility decreases. So we would have to win the argument, yes, to win that. Okay, sure. No question. Okay. Um, I guess we can talk about gray zone conflicts or provoc- yeah. yeah, so, go for it. Example of like a gray zone infraction, or I don't really know what to call them, but um, thing that like resulted in a miscalculate like a like someone overstepped they perceived it as uh something that was potentially more what can you sorry say that one more time based on operation that resulted in a misinterpretation of the operation that was led to something broader well that has obviously never happened because we said if that did happen that would go to war and our argument is that it only recently has china become more aggressive and more bold that's the evidence we should bring in case All right. um <laughs> We're going to use some more of our prep. We use 150, so 110's left. Uh, time will start. Oh, I'll show it. Yeah. That's our That's our okay. okay. Um, the order is going to be the neg and then the af or neg wing af. Everyone ready? Cool. On our case, go to mar- modeling. Article 9 is created a peaceful development model ad- adopted by the entire Eastern Asian region, lowering conflict by over 70%. Revision would upset this peaceful balance, fearing a return to conflict. Tensions and rising militarization would fuel the conflict that would invite international withdrawal and risking a nuclear war through miscalculation, extinction, and, and cause extinction through radiation caused nuclear winter. Wi- uh, winter. They give you a couple of responses. First, the Comito term, but the Comito term doesn't make sense because they literally can see that the revision happened in 2014 and their impact didn't, and their impact didn't happen. On the coup term, they don't even read an impact, so it doesn't matter. But um, they give you two responses. First is this ABAR thing. Uh, our evidence post dates it. It literally tells you that it, it literally tells you that there is peace now. But secondly, this was shot down right after it was proposed, which means like it never happened and, and like it didn't even matter because there was never support. Also, this was a reinterpretation, not an amendment to their constitution. This is a way bigger deal and a way bigger bite to the link. Then they tell you, oh, it relies on people seeing them as a threat. But no, this argument is literally in context of revision. But once it's gone, you know you no longer have the essentially pacifism assured by 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 Japan, which is having the Article Nine. But secondly, this requires countries to believe that they are championing peace, which they are just not. There's literally 
literally no chance. And also the other countries are aggressing, not uh, not uh, not like Japan or China. That's our argument is that everyone in the region sees that Japan builds up military. So they start aggressing and they don't believe the peace anymore. On Wang, first we outweigh China because you're increasing everywhere. Uh, you're, you're increasing gray zones because literally you're increasing Chinese aggression because no longer they're, they're a pacifist. But secondly, China, China is not the only belligerent actor. We argue that everyone around the region becomes a belligerent actor when you no longer have peace. That's a way bigger impact. It's way scalar and it multiplies there by like whatever uh, the amount of countries are like five, six, seven, it's just a bigger impact. But then remember, we argued that there's a great power draw and which means there's other actors, which means increased miscalculation risk. A, the miscalculation risk is better than their case because you know it's like a hundred actors instead of just one. But secondly, it's like it's like literally every, co- every country in the region, which is just a way bigger impact if miscalculation does happen. But finally, it's a model for peace. Remember that war stays in the gray zone because there is peace right now. But when you, when you, like, uh, when you take away that link, there is no longer war. Let's go to their case. Firstly, Oh, understand. Like their case, the uniqueness overwhelms the link. If America is really unpredictable per their uniqueness, they won't get involved in like conflict stays limited or B, America is credible and will get involved, which means no country will invade. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but specifically on responses they concede. First on the rich evidence, they give you one response, which is that they'll get destroyed. Remember, our evidence is really good. It says it only happens in a user lucid situation. And our evidence says that this is an existential crisis. That means they're going to use it. The rich evidence tells you there are various reasons to assume even if relations are under you, North Korea is unlikely to use its nuclear weapons. But the Shiran evidence tells you, given Pyongyang's history of perceiving Japanese moves as ex- ex- essential threats and offensive Japan will push Kim Jong-un over their next two responses don't even like interact because uh, because it's not talking about Japan. Um, okay, on their second contention, firstly, Japan's strategically defensive posture doesn't matter. The Horn evidence tells you that Japan, regardless of what Japan calls its new capabilities, the region is going to see them as offensive weapons, which destroys peace. But secondly, even if China like does does aggress, the Nyuk evidence is really good in telling you that it doesn't matter what what warplanes they extend, uh, uh, be, uh, what warplanes they go because tensions have cooled no, no matter what. Also, the impact of preemptive strike is literally a, a miscalculation that leads to extinction because it causes nuclear war. Also, greater zone operations stay great because of the peace. The latent evidence tells you great zone operations are designed to avoid military obser- uh, uh, observations. That's why the New York evidence is true because even if they're flying warplanes, nothing happens. Really quickly, you cut out. What did you say right before it? Gray zone stays gray and in between if China aggresses, they do a preemptive strike. It's this your third response in our second. Oh, time. it wasn't a response. It was a contextualization of the impact. It was just saying like, if like the miscalculation happens, it's going to cause nuclear war. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'll take that. Okay, um, I'm gonna call.
Okay. I have that at that time. Sorry. I think it's time. I'll oh yeah, yeah, we're we're good. We're on. Give me one second. My stuff is going. Okay. Is anyone not ready? It's going to start on the app. Really easy to vote for our China argument when they spend just 30 seconds of it on their summary. Our argument is that China is trying to gain strategic advantage with the gray zone, subtle attacks that are below the threshold for a response. Unfortunately, the US-Japanese alliance doesn't have a way to effectively respond to these attacks, allowing China to think they're able to get away with it and continue more attacks. Indeed, if China continues ramping up their gray zone attacks, it's easy for them to miscalculate the magnitude of their attack and cause all-out war that kills millions of people. Let's go through my opponent's responses first. At the top, they say that uniqueness overwhelms the link and that the US is unpredictable and they're going to get involved. That's literally not true because they can see their evidence for a case that says the US does not get involved in gray zone attacks literally because it's not an armed attack and that's all they're obligated to do in the realm of Japanese uh, like defense. Also, they can see that like tensions are high right now. So this, this response does, is not apply, applicable. But then on North Korea specifically, they say that North Korea is going to launch a preemptive strike and it only happens if they use it or lose it. But they also can see the analysis that Japan isn't seen as a threat. And they also just assert the fact that North Korea sees the Japan as an existential threat. They don't give you any warranting. This is not a voting issue. You cannot evaluate this in the round. But on the China responses more specifically first, they say that they see, they say that Japan is like being seen as more defensive, but still that is our argument. Japan is going to be deterring China China. Remember that China is not actively trying to pursue war. They want to build up their status as an economic economic hegemon, hegemon in the region, and they're doing these small scale attacks to establish their strategic advantage. If they think that the cost of going to war is too high, they are not going to do it. That is the whole point. We are trying to stop them from doing the grace attacks in the first place. But then they say that if China is aggressive, um, there's going to be a larger period to strike. Um, Again, but that, but again, like China is not trying to be, um, it's not going to start an all-out war. They're going to escalate and miscalculate into war with the brazen attacks. That is our link. Then they say the miscalculation is going to lead to nuclear war. Who? What war? They don't give you any after analysis. No war. They just assert this thing. It's literally not responsive. But then they say that the brazen attacks stay gray. Again, no warranting, no fleshing out. This response isn't responsive. But I'll tell you why it isn't gray because these responses or these attacks be, are, aren't gray because they slowly start to become more aggressive. And as China is able to get away with it without any response from the U.S. or Japan, they get more and more bold, and that miscalculation ends up leading to war. And they cross the threshold of war and the US and Japan get involved. But then let's go to the weighing, um, let's go to the let's let's go to the weighing more specifically. You can outweigh our case on theirs on um because if China is no longer able to do gray zone, there's no regional destabilization on their case because there's no medium for it to happen. But then let's go to let's go to their case. They're still not winning it here. First. Um, on modeling specifically, first remember that they can see that Abe, they just say, like, remember that Abe reinterpreted the conversation of the constitution and it literally didn't happen. They just say that it's not an amendment. That doesn't matter insofar as Article 9 is no longer seen as a beacon of peace. That means that no, it's not going to be a, a model for peace in the region in the future. But secondly, um, they all, but, but secondly, they never tell you who is looking to Japan as a model for this inspiration. They don't tell you what democracy is looking for it or how it's a beacon of democracy. There's so many questions on this argument that you do not feel comfortable putting on a bit. But then Jesus says that like China's a pacifist. No, they're not. They're doing grace and attacks in the status quo. But then they just say that it's like they're going to do a preemptive strike again. That's literally not going to happen. But then when they're weighing specifically, they say that China's going to increase grace on everywhere and that there's peaceful now. No, there is. They're doing grace and attacks right now. But then they say they outweigh because everyone becomes a belligerent and there's other actors, but they never tell you who these actors are. They never tell you who is going to get involved. It's much more probable on our side because China is actively doing the grace on attacks that have the best risk of miscalculation that leads to war. You literally have no idea any of what they're saying. They literally just assert all of their links without any, like, all their responses without any warranting. It's a really clean up ballot. Ready for Grand Cross? Yeah, uh, we'll do, we're both In here. Canada. I'll slide over. Okay. Uh, ben, do you have a question? Start things off. Uh, yeah, sure. So I know this is kind of like a rehashed question, but what exactly so like what what helps like china you know like gain dominance because they have like 200 nautical miles of like okay so sure. yeah yeah china is not doing gray zone to like go to war it's like a little different than like what we see right now like russia does hybrid warfare that is leading up to an invasion china's not leading up to an invasion they're doing gray zone because they want to rise as an economic and diplomatic power and that means when you build islands essentially you get like the extended EEZ, which is like a new shipping lane in the middle of the ocean that previously did not belong to them. But in, in turn, this is invading the territory and sovereignty of other countries. That's just one example. But China's becoming increasingly bold. They've been doing more cyber attacks on countries like Japan. They've been doing more like economic subversion, things like this that aren't an armed attack because that's all the United States responds to. Our evidence indicates that if Japan had its own offensive capabilities, it would complicate China's calculations and they wouldn't do it anymore because it sends a message that Japan would respond because they know the United States is not going to respond. It's not an armed attack. 
And these attacks are these things are getting increasingly more bold to the point where it eventually leads to war. A quick follow up. Okay, so if their strategy is like incumbent on the fact that like, you know, we're not trying to go to war, we're just trying to like slowly gain strategic ground, why would they risk? A it's not, yeah. Okay, they, if they saw like, you know, oh my gosh, like a, a, a missile trigger, like it could, we could miscalculate that. Why would China not, you know, like take the second step to be like, oh, you know, I don't think that's going to happen because we really don't want to mess up the good thing we have. Well, they're not going to do a missile strike, but they are, they, like, a realistic example of what would happen is that they, like, go in and they actually, in like, take up the territorial waters that surround the Senkaku Islands, which are recognized to be part of Japanese territory. Like, to them, that probably seems like something that would not be responded to by the United States because the United States has responded to zero things so far. China has been able to do literally whatever they want, and the United States has done nothing. And so our evidence indicates that because there is no red line for China, there is no idea of how far they can go. And they want to go as far as they can. They are like, we have free reign right now. We're going to take as much territory. We're going to do as much as we can. And that's what they're doing. And they're like, getting away with it. Like, that's the whole argument. They're getting yeah, away. Yeah, exactly. They're getting away with everything. Like, yeah. technology is not coordinated to, like, respond to it. They just kind of get away with it. And it's kind of like, okay, if I can get away with this, then I can get away with doing a little bit of something more risky. And it just kind of builds Exactly, on. exactly. Builds Thank you. Okay. Y'all can take a question. Um, if you have one. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about your impact scenario. So you say that everyone becomes belligerent, right? Because of the, so I guess for simplicity's sake, who is everyone? Like, who are we referring to when we say that like, everyone becomes involved? South Korea. I can keep listing countries. So they're, they're, South they're, Korea? They're, they're looking at Japan as a beacon of democracy. Well, actually, because they have for a lot, like most of the population wants South Korea to have nuclear weapons. So absent a model for peaceful development. I mean, a, clearly, like you yeah, can I see the Kulaki evidence that I read as early as rebuttal that says that is not the case. So that's, um, yeah. that's time. Okay. Uh, we're out of prep. So it'll go the North Korea argument, our case, then going back to their case. I'll be very clear about where I am. All right. Voting issue number one is North Korea. They have agreed that North Korea in the status quo will not launch a nuclear preemptive strike because they have non-nuclear means of achieving their goals. However, a world in which Japan militarizes is a world in which they face an existential threat. That's actual evidence we read. They say we can see the analysis that Japan isn't seeing the threat. What analysis? They just asserted this to be true. We have actual evidence on the question and the evidence says that North Korea has a history of interpreting every Japan's move as offensive. And as a result, they would launch a preemptive strike because it is use it or lose it. We are holding a knife to their throat. And as a result of such a strike, it kills millions of people and escalates into the same scenario as their second contention. That's said, let's uh, also you should prefer this argument on time frame. You don't know when these grades and warfare tactics necessarily escalate and cause like the uh, like, cause millions to die, but you do know that they launch it as soon as Japan militarizes. That's how let's go to our case. Our argument on modeling is very clear. Article 9 created a model for peaceful development adopted by the entire East Asian region, lowering conflict by over 70%. Region would upset the peaceful balance and fearing a return to conflict. Tensions and rising militarization would fuel a conflict that would invite international draw and risking a nuclear war through miscalculation and extinction through a radiation cost nuclear uh, winter. Even if you don't like the nuclear war impact, their impact is equally as vague. They just say millions die without specifying the conflict. We also link into such a similar conflict. So we're both talking about millions of people dead. It's who has the better link. We uh, Their only response is that Abe reinterpreted in 2014. Our tonnage evidence is more recent, and this was not a change to the Constitution. So the model is still there per the fact that gray zone tactics have not escalated per the fact that there have been no evasions and per the fact that there is still an article nine of japan's constitution in place that they are following very well which is what our argument is they say stuff about democracy the impact's not democracy it's about war and other countries getting drawn in they say we don't specify that's because they never asked us to they did to in summary to the who what when where i asked what but we explained to you that there are multiple belligerent actors china north korea etc it co-ops their scenario but it's more likely because there are more international actors involved in the region and they have actual incentives to attack whereas you're unclear about the time frame on their case. That said, if you don't believe a single thing I've said for the past minute and 40 seconds, they're not winning their China argument on their case. They've agreed that gray zone tactics stay gray zone because there is a specific tactical calculation of them to avoid escalation, which is why on probability there have been hundreds of infractions and no escalation. And the Nagak evidence finds that even though China has increased military activity because of things like diplomacy, tensions have cooled. So even if they're doing more tactics, it doesn't culminate in war. Okay, um, it's going to start on our case. Give me one second. Okay. On our China argument, 
this is a very easy place for you to vote for us. Our argument is that China is trying to gain strategic advantage with gray zone subtle attacks that are below the threshold for a response. But the US-Japanese alliance doesn't have a way to effectively respond to these attacks, allowing China to think that they're able to get away with it and can continue more and more bold attacks. Indeed, if China continues ramping up their gray zone attacks like the way they're doing right now, it's easy for them to miscalculate the magnitude of their attacks and cause an all-out war, killing millions. They have two responses. Number one is that gray zone always stays gray. No, the evidence that we read in case says that China is risk averse, is, is risk prone, and is willing to go bolder and bolder because there is no red line. There is no line as to what is the threshold for a response, and it's easy for them to accidentally miscalculate that and cause war. Remember, we're not saying they want to go to war, but that it accidentally happens, and all of our evidence supports this, whereas this is just an uncarded assertion by them. Then they say that tensions have cooled. We said over and over again that this is an old card from like 2021. We're talking about we have the most recent evidence that tensions have not cooled, and that China is doing aggressive actions in the status quo. But then what really loses them the round is the fact that they do zero weighing of their own in their final focus. They can see Abiram's root cause analysis weighing that they're, if China is no longer able to do gray zone attacks, which is their strategy for being a belligerent actor, then there is no regional destabilization de de on their case because there's no medium for them to actually go and conduct this. If we take away their medium, then there's no longer any war in either world. That's why you vote for us. On their North Korea scenario, in summary, they just asserted that's an existential threat. They did not read a card name. Do not let them come up in final focus and be like, oh yeah, no, it's a card. Remember, what we read you the core evidence throughout the round that says that no analysts in Asia actually perceive nor Japan as a threat, even if they militarize. The analysts are the most important because they're the ones who make the decisions, regardless of whatever their state-run media is telling you. Then. On their case, they dropped the ball in final focus when they dropped the New York Times evidence that says Abe reinterpreted the Constitution in 2014, which destroyed Article 9 as a symbol for peace. Because Article 9 was destroyed as a symbol, that means people did not use it as a model. After 2014, the revision doesn't have an impact. Good round, y'all. Good round. Yeah. Good round. All right. Um, I have the decision that's middle box. Can we wait a second? Yishan's not back yet. He went yeah, yeah, of course. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, is everyone good? All right, cool. Um, so kind of congratulations to both teams for making it this far. Um, the decision is a 2-1 for the con, and I squirreled, so I can go first. Um, so the order in which I evaluate the arguments is the North Korean ter turn first, because it's weighed as a prerequisite to the China argument, which is weighed as a prerequisite to the modeling argument. So that's the order in which I'm evaluating the arguments. I do think the North Korean argument ends up being a wash, because on one side, I have the neg arguing it as a threat, the other side saying that it will not be perceived as a threat. Both are carded with evidence, and I evaluate both cards, because just because you don't extend the card name, as long as the card name is read in the beginning, like in rebuttal, I think the extension is fine. Like, I just want you guys also don't extend the card name in summary. So I end up evaluating both cards. I mean, I'm, nobody gives me a reason to prefer like one piece of evidence over the other. So I just end up washing that argument. So then I look to China, which I think the app is probably winning a little bit. I have two responses that one, gray zones won't escalate, and two, that tensions have cooled right now. But I think one, the miscalc stuff that Edgewan is extending response to the fact that gray zones won't escalate, um, and then that the app is extending every speech, and then two, that tensions have cooled, like you have a posted posted a piece of evidence and that's never contested. So I think that both of those respond to the two arguments that the neg is extending, and I would probably give you some bit of the China offense, even if it's just off miscalculation sometime in the future. But even when I look to modeling, I don't think the neg is winning the argument that like revision in the past has already destroyed the symbol and none of that stuff happened so there's no like significant impact where you can you contextualize me a significant impact to how much worse the modeling gets or like why it didn't happen before you're not answering any of that you're not contextualizing what countries are modeling how that would happen so it makes me hard to sign it makes it hard for me to sign my ballot there um i can go next <clears throat> i think that north korea is really easy for me to vote on to be honest they give me the warranting that it's like use it or lose it and I think even if I buy the front line that's coming out, that's like the analysts don't believe it. I think that there's probably a risk of offense, which is probably enough for me to negate. But even if I don't want to vote on North Korea, I think that the China argument in Ishan's final focus, it was really smart to make the argument that it's like both a nebulous conflict scenario, which the modeling argument intrinsically links into. I think that 
whoever wins a better link into like these nebulous conflicts probably wins the round. And I think that you in final folk are that Edgemont in final focus makes a big mistake extending one response that Ishan preemptively front lines. I think that it's extended very well um, in summary and final focus, the modeling argument. I don't really think it needs to be contextualized to who, like the who, what, when, where, why. I like hate that response in um, like debate in general. But I also think that even if I don't believe that it's a small nebulous conflict, you're never contexting the link or contextualizing or a response to the link that's like, it goes nuclear, which is probably an easy way for me to vote for them because they're saying a, any kind of decrease in the modeling means that there's a chance that countries are less peaceful, which inherently means that there's going to be more miscalculation and eventually lead to escalation and extinction. I think that's never contested other than this 2014 reinterpretation thing. And they make the distinction that's like, it's reinterpreted, they're still following, they're not doing offensive operations, which probably signals to the rest of the world that they're a model for peace. Um, I think that in, in if I was, I think that this was a poor argument to go for, in my opinion. I think revision spiral is much better to go for in this round. I think you could have easily won it because the front line is the same. The front line is literally the same thing. That's literally their only response to it. It's like they already reinterpreted it. And you could also prereq everything they do because if Japan is like a revisionist or like a fascist state, they turn inward, which probably means that gray zone conflicts get worse and North Korea gets more angry. It just supercharges both of the turns you're reading on both of the, their sub points. I think it was just a poor strategic decision, but I think modeling ended up working anyways. So I don't really have any other feedback on that. I think that for the AF, I probably would have, I think there was a turn. No, I, on the AF, I think you just need to do a better job responding to the modeling argument in the back half. Cause I think that you're kind of just re-articulating what you say and it doesn't really like get, like you don't respond to their back lines when they are frontlining this 2014 thing. And I don't think that your argument really develops on that. So it makes it really hard for me to not just like assume their argument is true in the context of the flow. Okie dokie. Um, I'm kind of glad it was a 2-1 decision because I thought it was pretty close. And uh, I feel like my perspective is a little bit more as a truth judge than a tech judge. I, although I would agree that um, based off of the other feedback, it did seem that there were a lot of assumptions and prerequisites that were made that weren't clearly established. So when it came to the neg constructive, I thought that it was kind of a shotgun approach, which was good in the fact that you had a lot of different options, but it was bad because it meant that you weren't able to develop a lot of your points. So I thought the revisionist spiral was also the most compelling, but because you weren't developing that, it was way closer than it needed to be. Um, the question on the AF though, about like, okay, where is the money going? That's a really good question. Um, and if I were able to give speech to this round, I would probably give AF the, the, the higher points. So it'd be a low point one on the neg purely just because there, there was a lot of really pointed question and solid analysis created. Um, that said, when it came to the uh, affirmative constructive, I actually didn't find the North Korea point that compelling just because there was such a, like anything that deals with nuclear holocaust or an existential risk of that capacity, the magnitude is really high, but the probability is super low. And North Korea has a habit of just posturing and not doing anything about it. Whereas I feel like China's a way, way bigger risk and has demonstrated to have a lot of like violations in terms of international peace treaties before. So that is kind of the the uh, unfortunate aspect of the AF case that I wish was developed more because you spent so much time worrying about North Korea that the China aspect wasn't developed fully. Um, what also ended up trapping the AF for me was when it was discussing gray zones, the NEG did a good job of saying, hey, it goes both ways. So based off of the status quo, this is already a problem, but we're not really gonna have war in the traditional sense, like with what happened with Russia. And while there, there is a risk, it's more of an economic analysis rather than like a, a physical kind of hot war between two countries, which then revisits the question of what does Article 9 have to do with any of this? So my main challenge was that what is Japan's role specifically in terms of what it models to other countries? And that wasn't really cleanly linked in terms of like South Korea or any of the other countries. And there was a lot of like uh, speculation of what would happen rather than like pointing to specific examples. I've seen um, the uh, ASEAN like alliance being used. I don't think that's compelling. However, where I wish there was more development was this uh, um, or almost analysis on like domestic issues and how that influences international politics. So it could go both ways. On the um, affirmative, you could say that actually the United States as a hegemon is terrible. So um, what's happening in Okinawa as a base is pretty horrific 
the Okinawans hate the United States because they keep like sexually assaulting their citizens and the military gets away with it because they have power. On the con, you could say that, well, there's concerns, like you said, with revisionist spiraling and there's this notion of like right-wing extremism that's rising to power. Japan is historically really xenophobic, pretty homophobic. The uh, uh, Kushida is pretty sexist. There are a lot of things that you could have talked about domestically, but it got so bogged down in the international relations that it wasn't developed. So I feel like that would have at least given a little bit more credence to the round. Um, that said, I, again, especially to uh, Masam, you did such a good job of just synthesizing the information and making it accessible. But I wish that I could reward that outside of just like giving a winner loss. So I just want to acknowledge it for what, what you did. Um, and I'm glad it was a 2-1 because it was a very good round. That said, um, I am willing, I mean, the other two judges left, but I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. Um, and good job. And you should be proud of the work that you did. I think unless y'all have anything more good. Yeah, thank you for judging. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Good luck. Hey, everyone. Bye. Bye.